Right. First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone. We haven't been in action for, I think, for four months, is it now, Maria? And um, yeah, the, re the Dynamo user group, when did we start? How, how many meetings have we had now? Quite a few. 2019 we started, was it? Or 2018? 2018. 2019, October we started, first one. Gee, time flies. And here we are. So it's 18, it is 18, eh? That's what I thought it was 18. You know, we've done more than that. Yeah. Normally we meet every two months. So um, it's been a bit of uh, activity around trying to get this one off the ground as well. Um, and I think we, we are hosting it externally too, aren't we? We're broadcasting it this time as well. Is that the first time? I think it is. So it's great to um, be able to see afterwards how many people have enjoyed the session. And um, tonight, um, oh, let me introduce myself first for those that don't know me. I always assume people know me. I've been in this business now for 25 plus years. Yeah, I'm getting gray. So I'm, uh, my name is Marcel Van Ostrom. I work for Kepro Systems. I actually returned to the company last year, September, um, after being away for 20 years from the business. Um, I started, um, well, Gepro was started in 1992 by my business partner at the time, Hans Grotegut, and uh, we had a, uh, another person on board there by the name of Eric Stride. So well, early beginnings for us diving into the Autodesk uh, partnership environment. And um, we were basically three tiers, it was mechanical structure and architecture. I was the architectural side of the business. It wasn't much of a mechanical engineer, definitely not structure. So um, we formed together Capro Systems and um, uh, in, in, in early days, Hans Grotegut started. I was joined by Eric Stride and after that, um, I joined the team as well in 1994, I think. Right about that time, I can't remember. 10 years, 1996, there we go. So 2006, I decided to um, break away and go back in the industry. So I worked for various companies like Warren Armani as well, by the way, for I think about 40 months, 80, 80 months, I think. Um, GHD, until uh, I passed the reins over to um, Amadeo. And Amadeo now works at GHD, quite enjoying the corporate environment. And um, I decided to go back with um, Capro Systems, promoting the audit as solution range of, um, of um, products. Um, Next slide before I start talking over my slides. So we, we are completely New Zealand owned and operated. Uh, been in business for well over 25 years, um, 1992. So we're nearly 30 years in 2022, I think, long time. Um, range of technical services, you know, customer focused, very much driven around um, design organizations. And we cover a range of um, disciplines from manufacturing, infrastructure, architecture, engineering, uh, and construction industry as well. At the moment, we're heavily involved in construction cloud technologies with Autodesk. That seems to be a very big focus for the, for the organization. Um, 25 employees, they're listed on the screen there. Um, quite a few of us and a few more joining as well. So yeah, it's interesting that um, when COVID came in, we thought, where is this going to go? And um, we haven't stopped working and we actually had to accelerate the business and take on board more people in order to fulfill the demand. So it's good to see that the technology is being taken up by a lot of organizations who previously didn't really believe they could work cloud-based solutions and work remotely. And that we've seen a complete turn of events by them adopting these technologies um, during this time. Um, the four areas that we're um, definitely very active in and the one that is going to be pushed a lot harder over the ne next few years, obviously, is civil and infrastructure. So we've taken on board um, um, another, another person in a few weeks that will drive that environment. So it will be nice to be able to uh, get a foothold uh, in that environment and provide some solutions to the industry. Tonight, I was able to um, score Alex Tweedy and... Um, I, I saw Alex, you, everybody can see him there, right? There he is. Hi, everyone. <laughs> he's, he's based in Sydney. Am I right, Alex? Correct, yes, I'm in there Sydney. So I, I came to know about Alex when um, he was involved with an Autodesk present, presentation about generative design. I think probably it was about three or four weeks ago with Sam McAllister from Autodesk. And I thought, that's the guy we've got to get for a user group, you know, to do a presentation. And um, I approached Alex and said, listen, I said, how about, you know, a bit of sheer mind and um, connecting with us and maybe you can connect more people within the um, Australian environment back to New Zealand so we can broaden our view with regard to um, 
you know, generative design and um, Dynamo. And I think we, we want to broaden the Dynamo um, group a little bit into other technologies as well. And I think we've discussed between all of us that we uh, might tackle that next year to bring in other technologies such as Grasshopper and, and um, various other programming languages too. So yeah, getting connected is good. And um, Alex will show, Alex has got a long history in computer science and that um, that's quite um, impressive from a person like me that I've tried to get into the programming side so many times in my life and I just don't have the patience. So I totally admire anyone that brings up the patience to do coding. And obviously for them, coding is like a language for me. They just learn it and adopt it and, and, and work with it. So Alex is very, very experienced. I'm very impressed with his presentation a few weeks ago. And um, we are here tonight to uh, see some of his skills. So I'll hand you over to Alex. Um, and I think we might need to stop the share and him to share the start the share, yes. I believe. So we'll go through that. So, Alex, give us a moment and then um, we can start the share and you, you're on. So can everybody hear me now? Yep, and I think we can increase the sound a little bit. So Al Alex can okay. hear us through this microphone. So if anybody's got any questions, you just need to hand the microphone around and you can ask him questions as well. I believe Alex uh, is going to give us a bit of a presentation um, and then afterwards we'll have a bit more of an interactive session as well. Um, so, um, hello everyone. Thanks, Catbro, and, and thanks, Alvaro and Mahani, for um, helping us to share knowledge in a sense. Um, I have a lot to cover today, uh, so uh, with no further ado, I'll, I will jump to the examples of um, Dynamo and Grasshopper. Uh, can everybody hear me? I just want to make sure that uh, everybody can hear me fine. So, it looks uh, like it's the case. Um, just one second. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, there is a lot, like I'll, I'll just, what I do today, the format of the presentation is like, I'll, I'll give a quick brief entry, um, introduction about uh, myself and um, my business. And then I'll um, um, run through some um, Dynamo examples and use cases, and then um, dive a little bit um, deeper into the uh, workflows and um, at the end for last 20 minutes hopefully we're gonna run an um, example file um, like um, exercise uh, I believe everyone should have access to the um, uh, files that we have provided uh, further if you're gonna um, continue along uh, watching um, what we are doing so with no further ado let me all um, start uh, my presentation. Okay. Uh, so let's go into it. So like um, the reason that I started um, my own uh, business as a subcontractor, which is called Humatech, was like I found this is the best kind of um, possible approach to be able to reach out to many people and be uh, more productive in the sense of um, uh, sharing um, the knowledge. So um, essentially we know construction projects are very complex, a lot of people involved and it might not seem that like uh, an individual contractor can do a lot in this space but I believe in, um, um, uh, if we uh, share knowledge and um, uh, work uh, with each other. It's just a matter of collaboration. This um, kind of platforms, as you can see, uh, we'll, we'll go um, deeper into this. But um, the reason that I started to work as a contractor is to be able to provide more um, feedback and services to businesses if they um, need. So by the way, if any of these use cases you see uh, seems interesting um, to you, uh, reach out to me by my email on the slide down here. Just a little bit about me. I studied electronic years ago, 25 years ago, almost. I never really practiced electrical engineers, um, went to the drafting side of the structural drafting side of things and then I studied computer science so it's been a very long journey for me not necessarily easy one but it's it's an interesting field and um, there is so much that can be done within this space so I'll provide training and as I said I work as a contractor sole contractor 
uh, my interest of system implementation and dyno um, and automation uh, using various tools, um, geometry and data. This is this is um, the graph that uh, resemble a harbor bridge. So uh, going to the next slide. This is me after COVID. Things has changed a little bit <laughs> with everyone. So hopefully things will go back um, to the normal soon. I like social science, data-driven design, optimization, geometry, and data, and 3D printing in particular is like really interesting uh, for me. I've studied a lot about 3D printing. <clears throat> okay, um, to start the presentation, one thing to note is um, this type of, uh, unlike conventional um, method of um, drafting, this, this type of tools, they essentially works on data. I mean, um, by data, I'm referring to um, essentially text and CSV file format. Raw data, which is um, not application dependent, and it's like in terms of trans um, interoperability between the application, it's a lot better to work with data because their data, it, does, it doesn't really rely on the interface of the program that uh, generate the data. So that's why I think these tools are really um, powerful. It's just a logarithmic um, curve. Uh, the reason that I'm showing this is like, um, it shows that, um, uh, this is this is from the presentation of Mustafa um, Ladybug, author of Ladybug Tools. Uh, the collective knowledge of human, as you can see in this case, it's a logarithmic curve. So um, what we will learn in next 10 years, you could say it's equal to a hundred years before us. So like the amount of knowledge and um, that we are gaining is accelerating um, uh, logarithmically. And the only way that we can actually get things running and use these tools is by sharing our knowledge because we are all essentially building on top of each other knowledge. So it's not like I know all of everything and it's like, it's just a, a collaboration work. So that's, that's just um, to um, show about that. So like, um, Overall, like what I'm going to do is like uh, quickly talk about parametric design tools and integrated data environments. Since since I said like these are um, these geometries, uh, unlike the conventional way, way of drawing, these are based on the data. You'll see what I mean, and I'm sure you guys all know. So this is this is the um, ecosystem that we can use. Um, Autodesk product Revit and Dynamo, which is a, a programming a visual programming environment. Same thing goes for Rhino and Grasshopper. And um, both of the, these environments get connected uh, to Python and Visual Studio, like for C Sharp, if you need to um, code things um, a little bit more robust. I'm going to open this can of worm, like Grasshopper versus Dynamo question. Um, well, there is a lot that can be said there. Um, in general, Grasshopper, I found it's a lot better in terms of because the um, geometry engine of Rhino is a lot more flexible than, um, than Revit. So it might be the best to use uh, Grasshopper to model the geometry and use Dynamo to handle Revit data. They are interchangeable. Like when we talk this level of um, tools, it's, uh, it's very important to um, know that it is about the workflow and the flow of data between the application, not the actual tool. So to put that as, um, behind, like what I'm talking um, mainly is about Dynamo, but the same can be implemented um, in Grasshopper most of the time, especially now with a Rhino inside technology that we can see. Uh, the very last thing to say about this is like what I think Autodesk should be doing better and I have raised this concern uh, with them. I mean, like who am I to um, tell them what to do or what's the marketing strategy? But I think like if they have vertical, at the moment they have vertical marketing strategy versus horizontal. So like they own a product and um, they distribute it. But um, I think if they go horizontal and let people use it of Dynamo, um, create more applications and they see themselves as a facilitator of the ecosystem, things will change um, for a better, a lot, a lot better. Like I believe Grasshopper is better in doing a better job there, having um, many um, various uh, plugin. So this is, this is just a, this is just an environmental um, plugin. 
uh, environmental analysis plugin called um, Ladybug, this one. Ladybug Honeybee, you can do energy analysis, you can do a lot of awesome stuff here. Um, daylight analysis, comfort study, and all of that. I'm not going into this, but if you need to know more about this, please reach out to me. So what you can see in this picture, it's a uh, movement of the sun in the sky in the South Pole for some reason. I just decided, wanted to see how some moves in the South Pole. And at the bottom picture here, you can see um, I'm measuring the effect of this um, horizontal fins on the total solar gain of the space. So you can see having this arrangement of the fins for this particular room, it will improve, it will um, reduce the total solar gain of the space by 70 uh, percent. So we can actually measure these things. Um, this is just the, like you, you define a test point and you just see how much, um, how effective these things, um, the, the uh, vertical or horizontal fins are. This is more in terms of like having more sustainable uh, buildings and going down the path of passive design strategy. <clears throat> One more time, it's about the workflow. <laughs> it's not about the tools. So Dino or Grasshopper question, we'll leave that behind for now. So computational design uh, field is a very interesting and broad um, field of, um, knowledge I should say and it's like as we're talking it's evolving like people are doing a lot of uh, a lot of people are doing their PhD in this field a lot of people are, are releasing codes and it's just very interesting to for me to observe what is happening and it's like just a never-ending uh, learning process from what I can say. <clears throat> Going to Dynamo um, why Dynamo? I think like it's a common data environment, operate on data and logic. It's, it's essentially you work with data as you can see here. These are data passing through these nodes, entry to the nodes, output of the node. This is a C-sharp function, get some, um, manipulate the data which is entering the node, some sort of manipulation, calculation, and pass the data out. So you can build the logic through this. And if you fall short, if Dynamo falls short, which is the case in many scenarios, there's always Python available to you, which is the most um, um, human readable syntax, easy to learn relatively, very powerful um, libraries for data manipulation, AI, and um, all, um, Panda, like for instance, Panda um, is one uh, library for Python. There is a lot of um, libraries that can be used in terms of um, implementing AI and machine learning. Um, one advantage that I think Dynamo has over Grasshopper at the moment is like having access to um, all the data which is saved within Revit. Because in Revit we have, like, you know, we have all the BIM data in um, uh, associated with Revit element. We can get ge geometry data out of elements as well. So like it's a quite um, rich repository for labeled and labeled data. So by labeled and labeled, like these are machine learning terms that um, you, you can use them uh, to kind of, um, get more insight about the data. <clears throat> Dynamo, we talked about this. It's a high level programming, visual programming environment. So like to develop codes, it's quite fast in Dynamo. However, like a lot of people are, um, and this is true, like it's not, um, when it's, um, when Dynamo wants to deal with large amount of data, it might fall short. And if that's the case, then, um, the code can be totally um, be written in um, Python or uh, C sharp. So it's essentially a good tool for prototyping and quick development of the um, tools. <clears throat> I always use helper uh, diagrams because you essentially, when you create a dynamo graph, like you need to have a logic, your logic sorted, and you know what, what is exactly, what's the sequence of action that you're going to take through the dynamo. Um, graph. So like I always use flowchart, class diagram, workflow diagram, and system diagram. Um, 
for example. So it's a, it's an open source visual programming environment. Some some might say, oh, well, this is not open source since it's working with Revit and Revit is a subscribed uh, product. So like that's a very valid question, but like it's an open source and it comes as a standalone product as well. So Dynamo Sandbox, you don't need to have um, Revit installed to use Dynamo. It has a somewhat active community, but it, I believe there is a lot more that can be done there if industry and people come together to kind of um, develop this. So these are um, some of the examples that I'm going to go through. Uh, the first one is the um, Sydney Harbour Bridge. This is, this is what the uh, graph looks like. And um, you get the formula of the arch essentially and then like built it built that into your um built that into your dynamo graph but the beauty of dynamo graph and parametric environment is like once you model things um once correctly and elements holding their relationship geometrical relationship um to to the, to the other elements then you can change the parameters and you will get multiply results so like as you can see for this instance um, one parameter is number of vertical elements, as you can see in this picture, um, uh, down left. Like I, I decrease the number of the vertical element or I change the um, formula of the arch of the bridge, made it wider, and it's still the relationship of the element holds together. So these are the number of the parameters there. So it's a parametric design sort of um, concept. And of course, like you can bring this um, into uh, Revit if you want to. These are all steel beams. Another example, um, this would be, um, there's this node called display uh, geometry by color. And what I'm doing here, I'm essentially getting one element out of the Revit and color coded based on the, uh, on the thickness of the element. So you can see where it is blue, which is at the middle, the element is the thickest. So this is this is this node you can use. You can um, map the color on the surface if you want to. But where did we use it? This is Sydney Metro um, project. Um, I was working with um, my colleague uh, Adam Wormsley, who works for Autodesk now. And um, this is this is the Sydney Metro model. Like he did a great job there. But what we did using Dynamo was there. Uh, there is a ramp here where the um, this ramp uh, where it goes for the TBM machine, tunnel boring machine, to go under the ground. And they wanted to know if it has the um, required thickness. So the Dynamo graph looks a little bit nasty, but um, we essentially create a set of grid of points, project it up and measure the thickness and color code them. So they were able to see this is the area that um, has the less thickness. They went back into the design and kind of um, uh, fixed the problem that they had there for city metro. It's another use case. Um, this, this is a bridge um, in US. A friend of mine reached out to me and was like, oh, how do we model this? What they had was they had a, a CSV file. This is a parabolic curve um, for the pier down the bottom here, but they couldn't model it really. They had all of this uh, XYZ coordination of the point calculated using Excel, but they couldn't model. So like what, um, what we ended up doing was reading that Excel file, as you can see, here, reading that Excel file, parse the data, and then create the points so we were able to create the um, peer. And this is interesting because this is purely based on data. There wasn't any manual work involved. I mean, beside the creation of the Dynamo graph. So um, that's what it was. And then uh, bringing, uh, creating all the other points and um, we were able to model the geometry in Dynamo. And you know you can go a lot more complex than uh, what we originally did there, and yeah, this is like relatively, as you can see, relatively small dynamo graph. You can create this type of geometry. The other example I wanted to quickly talk about this is um, about Tunnel Sydney. Um, uh, has a lot of construction going on at the moment as well. Like this, this is for West Connect Tunnel, like years ago, three years ago. Um, we got data out of MX uh, in genuine format and then uh, used it to draw the central line, a little bit of Python, a little bit of Excel, a little bit of um, Dynamo to create a geometry in this. 
Um, this was never used as many of these use cases that I'm showing uh, to you, like they've never been used or implemented on the pro project. And I'll get back to that. I have a point on that to make that. But um, going back into the tunnel, uh, you can see you can um, model all the segments and there is no end to how complex you can make your geometry, as you can see. You can go further down if you want to, to even uh, model reinforcement and stuff automatically. I recommend watching this video um, on Autodesk University about rebar modeling uh, using Dynamo for bridges. It's pretty cool. So this is a total geometry of the bridge. And like, you know, you create a custom node here and uh, you can make it quite complex if you want. But this is, um, this is another interesting future of um, Dynamo, which is, I think the picture is a little bit blurry for me, it is so, but like you can actually code block, like you can write your code within the Dynamo environment. A function, entry to the function, mathematical calculation inside, output, right? So you can create kind of uh, algorithmic geometry if you need it to be. This one uh, was a, a, for a residential project. Back then I was working with this um, uh, structural engineering company that wanted to model the rebars. Quite complex. You can't really do this in only in Revit. Like I don't think you can because the way that Revit um, mesh the curve, um, they collide at the top. So, but like if you look at the reinforcement, they're parallel together here, the blue one. So um, at least it's not easy to model this in um, Revit, only Revit. This is another example, um, a tunnel shaft in um, one of the tunnels in Sydney, North Connect it is. They had, um, they scanned the um, opening of the shaft and then they had these points, data points measured by the scan, but they didn't know how to bring it back to uh, Revit. And essentially what they had was a text file format with X, Y, Z coordinate of each point. So essentially I just passed that using Python, um, get the location of the points and then assign an element family instance to each point. So this, these are like, you know, it was uh, sufficient enough for what we wanted to do, but um, there was a lot more that can be done there. By the way, look, I think point cloud has a lot of power as um, we advance in AI and object recognition within the point cloud. Like I think it has a lot of potential and we'll see more of it, I believe. Um, this is another example. Um, this was um, for BGE. and um, They've been awarded um, to uh, check the structure integrity of the existing bridges along um, New South Wales. And there were quite a few, like there were 200, 300 bridges. Uh, the normal process uh, was engineering going to the site, measure things, write them um, on the Excel file, come back to the, um, take notes, come back to the drafter, do the markup, give the drafter, check the markup to model the existing geometry pretty time consuming process. Um, what we ended up doing was um, we asked the engineer to go to the site and collect the data and put it in the Excel file format. So we create an Excel file with the, um, as a data entry point, we used Excel. So you can see they enter all of these parameters. And then we um, use Dynamo reading the Excel file, right? You can do this. And then um, we passed all the information out of the Excel file. So we got all the elements. And then based on that uh, relationship, we sort of managed to um, automatically generate the geometry of the bridge. Um, calculating these points, calculating other points, they're like all relationship based on each other sort of. So um, location of this point is a function of location of the other point. So there is a, a logical order that you go through to create that. and um, this is just the same thing. Um, and then at the end, we assign Revit um, adaptive component to, to the uh, geometry that was generated in uh, Dynamo and set the parameters of those elements. So like, as you can see, depth and width were two instance parameter of the Revit family instances that we were um, assigning here. And then like you can create quite complex geometries that way um, if you want to. These are all adaptive components. 
I mean, there is no bridge in this shape, but I just wanted to show the flexibility of it. Um, see, that's that's what I uh, meant by uh, when I said like the system need to get used. Like this system, we had it, and but it never got used. Like the reason was like people are change resistance. Like you know, like no, we've been doing it this way. Let's do it this way all the way through. Like we were able to model a bridge in 10 minutes using this, but it never got used. Like, and there are, there are concerns here, I understand. Like what if there is a mistake in Excel file? Like what if, and all of that things that we need to have a mechanism to check the process. But like I found the biggest challenge is to sort of um, making sure that if you building a system is ever gonna get used or not. So that's a question that needs to be answered. And like you need to build momentum around the tools that you build to, for it to get um, fully used. Uh, this is another example in Revit. Like you can see adaptive component assigned to this curve and this is curving in two directions. So that like, you know, that limitation that we had originally within Revit that like it can't really draw curves in three direction, in three dimensional curve. That problem is, uh, I believe a problem of past having dynamo available. Um, and this is, this is just an um, example of, another example of the bridge. And you can see a little bit of Python code. You can create a quite complex data structure, points here, poly surface, points, and like you can bundle all the data together. <clears throat> two main use cases that I can talk about, like, like system design or project specific solution that you can um, actually, obviously system design can get reused over and over again, uh, project specific solutions, complex geometry, these are just one off kind of projects. So like if you can identify uh, a process that can be automated, then um, there's a good chance that uh, we can actually uh, implement something in Dynamo. Example of system designs, I just quickly wanna say, um, this this I talked about already requirement gathering. It's the most important discussion in system development. Like, is this system going to get used? How are we going to use it? And these are very important conversation to have prior even beginning any implementation because my experience shows that a lot of systems, they don't get used unless you have a clear objective of the, okay, this is what we want and this is going to get used, then it's worth spending time on it. Um, examples of it, this is in Python, um, the result of the uh, structure um, engineering analysis um, plotted in the web browser um, using, um, using Python essentially. Just so like this is just like a very um, powerful way of visualizing data as long as like, you know, as well as Power BI and all of those, but this is quite powerful. Um, this is a this is an interesting one for me personally. Like I think um, what I'd use Dynamo, Python, Revit, Excel, a system that we developed here, and I'm hoping this is getting used. And I know it's it's getting used. Like it's um, they had a structure engineering firm. Each column you selected, there is there is property um, instance parameter for that column. Column like um, you say the type of the reinforcement that is used vertically, the type of the reinforcement which is used horizontally, and like you say N12-300, like we have N12 bar, I don't know what's the system in New Zealand, do you guys have N10, N12 reinforcement? I'm not quite aware of it, but that's how we do it in Australia. And then like getting those information um, out of the Revit instances. And also we can get geometrical data for each column, a start point and end point of each column. And then that way we can pass the data, um, come up with a solution to calculate the total weight of the reinforcement used in the um, design. Uh, this is considering all the lap between the bars, bending, and it's quite accurate. Like from originally they um, give this to graduate students and they were sitting there three days to kind of uh, calculate the total reinforcement <laughs> of usage. This was able to calculate it in like less than a 10 minutes or 20 minutes, um, depending like it's like if all the information is there. But like, again, I think this is redundant overall because this information is getting entered to the Revit model twice. Once calculated by engineers, once passed to the drafter uh, to fill each column with instance parameters like N12, 300, N300. Why not collecting those information directly 
um, from the engineers and populate this. This is another option, but hey, like a lot of things that we do are redundant, unfortunately. Uh, if we put data in the center of our uh, workflows, I believe a lot of redundance works will be um, um, will be eliminated. By the way, um, Geometry Jim, John, if you know about him or not, like he's doing a great job in terms of data interoperability using IFC between uh, Grasshopper, Dynamo, and all of that information. If 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 you have interoperability um, problems, that's a tool to uh, look. Geometry Jim. That's the name. <clears throat> the other example of system design is like, this is a quite simple application of AI. It's like um, what I'm doing here is like, I'm getting each column the geometrical uh, location of each column and then using data clustering algorithm, I'm able to like kind of cluster the data together. So like this building had nine uh, sort of um, level. Uh, we were able to group them together using this an uh, AI technique for to realize each beam belongs to what level. So essentially, what I'm saying, like this was just an experiment, really. Like I didn't really push it forward, um, but like it essentially is capable of eliminating, like you say, users assigning elements to a certain level. Like if you draw a beam like on level two, and you have to just, like you know draw a beam on level three, essentially. This um, AI application can pick up which level the beam belongs to. Something quite simple. I mean, like if you want to push these things, these are not a one-man work. If like I believe these are team works, and we need to like be clear if about what we want to um, implement. Uh, Another Dynamo usage, like connecting a space guest, it's a, um, a structure analysis tool um, with Dynamo, result of the space gas analysis passed into the Python code, create the lines and stuff. I use this many times like, because engineers um, use the space gas and then it's like, just give me the output of your analysis rather than drawing markups. And then like what I got was text files from them and I was able to model it. I mean, there are, um, there are downsides into it, like in reality, when you draw a beam, like it doesn't draw it all the way as, like there are more works to be done, but like it just um, shows how data is interchangeable between the application. A geometry gym, again, for this type of application. This is years ago, like I never used it. Um, going back to the project specific solutions, um, okay, here. So like um, parametric, design overall, it's very interesting concept. I'll, I'll cover a little bit uh, about uh, generative design at the end of this, but like, as you can see, like in the pictures at the top, these three pictures, um, we define a roof canopy once and it's parametric. So like you can change the parameter, like height was one parameter here and you can like, you know, you can change it and come up with many possible design. Uh, what makes this interesting is um, once you have access to many design, then um, you can evaluate them for certain functionality. And that way, that's where it's like essentially generative designs comes to um, play because it generates a lot of options and then you evaluate those options and you pick the one that performs the best based on your need. So that's, that's where um, the promise of generative design and all the other uh, optimization algorithm, um, optimal fine forming um, to meet the desired requirement and all of that comes um, true. So it's just like Galapagos is an evolutionary solver algorithm within grasshopper environment. Um, quite interesting, like this is, this is how it works. You feed in the fitness function, um, evaluate the fitness function and genome would be your input parameter. So it changed the parameter measure the fitness function, change the parameter, measure the fitness function. Why this is, this is interesting because uh, I have an example of this. Like I'll, I'll come back to uh, use of um, Galapagos in terms of like um, generative design. This is single objective evolutionary algorithm. Essentially how ants find, um, little ants find their optimal path to their food always. Uh, there are, um, multi-objective um, multi 
optimization algorithm, Wallace is one of them, these are green grass of our environment, Octopus is one of them. And then as we know, Revit recently um, released a, a Revit um, generative design for Revit, um, which has um, a quite nice slick interface, I should say, but uh, there's still a lot of work to be done there. And, you know, a lot of other um, platforms are already capable of um, doing it, as I mentioned before. In this example, very quickly, like what we are doing is um, a field region, select the field region in Revit, and then find the um, uh, arrangement, um, like lay down the desk on the field region, given the social distancing um, parameters um, are defined here, as you can see, like you have depth of the desk defined, distance between the uh, depth defined as one parameter, distance between this desk and this desk, adjusting desk, and all of those are defined parametrically. So, uh, and rotation angle of the desks. So the question that we had here, like given the parametric um, environment, like I wanted to know what is the um, optimal rotation angle for each desk, that if we set the desk into that rotation, we'll have the maximum number of the desks given all the social distancing rules are still in place. So essentially, I lay down the desk for angle 90, I lay, lay down the desk for angle 80, 70, and I explore the entire domain of the design, possible domain of the design. And I measure the fitness function that I had was the total number of the desk. So that way I could easily evaluate all the rotation angle and come uh, pick the maximum one. So that's a, that's essentially in nutshell what um, this kind of technology is. is. So for this um, kind of shape, it turned out the um, rotation angle of the desk would be around 70 degree and it's shape dependence, like, you know, um, use cases could be like, I don't know, how can you fit the most amount of desk in the cutting, you know, <laughs> for instance, so we're gonna go ahead. These pictures are just like, you know, to make my slides a little bit um, prettier. So generative design in natural is parametric modeling. Um, you create a wide domain of design and then you define a matrix of performance or benchmark if you like, and then you iterate and evaluate generated solution or, um, against the system goal to check the performance of the uh, design and then pick up the best performing one. This is more about evolutionary algorithm, like how Galapagos that I was talking about works before, like essentially it takes a derivative of the surface and find the optimal solution. Like I'm not gonna go into this, but like if you need to um, um, learn more about it, look up this document, it's quite interesting, give you an overview of how um, generative design primer for auto works. Having said that, like if you want to know more about the evolutionary algorithm, there are tons of materials out there really. <clears throat> a use of um, Galapagos in this, uh, I define a parametric kind of shading device in front of the room, measuring the effect of the fin that it has. And one of the parameters was the rotation angle of this fin. So I evaluate the function, which was this, like how effective is my um, horizontal or vertical fin in terms of blocking the sun. And then like I was able to evaluate that function for all the possible rotation angle and then pick up the optimal rotation angle. So now we can calculate depending on the orientation of your building, depending which side of the building these fins are sitting, we can actually calculate what is the optimal rotation angle for the fins to block the most amount of the sun if you need to. So these are data driven, it takes human into like um, human judgment out of the um, equation. And that's where I think it has the most power. As you can see, this is how I define the um, domain of um, uh, domain of design. So like you can see here, fin depth is one parameter, number of the fins another, and I can change and evaluate. Like I can generate a quite wide set of, um, designs, design sets, I should say. This is another example, 
33 minutes into my presentation. I'm gonna kind of, so this was um, a raindrop kind of simulation based on the physics. Like what happens if the rain hit this surface and one other surface hit here? So this is, this is the type of the geometry that we get. Uh, let me quickly show this dynamo. This is, this is essentially like what I'm doing. It's a physics um, formula. There's a phase frequency for the wave and amplitude for each wave. And then a center of the wave is defined as one parameter. As you can see, I change this and my geometry get updated on the fly. So that's a, that's a um, beauty of um, parametric design. Uh, this video goes for like almost two minutes, but toward the end, um, but you can see I'm changing. I, I drag this um, center of my wave to the corner, and now I can. Come on. You know, I can change the frequency. I can change the amplitude, and. I can even export my um, geometry. Like, you know, this is a higher frequency and all this type of um, crazy geometry and, and 3D printed, which I'm having it here, as you can see. So it's quite complex geometry. And these are like, this is quite constructible, like, because all you need is a CNC machine that can cut a surface in two in curve in two direction and then by assembling the curves next to each other, you actually create the illusion of this raindrop surface. So this is this is how the jump. This is a small, like it's like 15 centimeter by 15 centimeter. But I'm in the process of trying, hopefully, finding a CNC machine and um, making a future wall out of this. So this is a dynamo graph for it, like, you know, a little bit of mathematical linear algebra needed to be calculated and stuff, but the result is quite interesting. Like you can create geometries like this. And um, one thing to note is like when, see, like, because this is defined parametrically, I can change the parameter of my wave and everything, and I can come up with the different designs. How we want to evaluate them? I don't know, I haven't pushed it that far yet, but like, you know, you can evaluate and essentially come up with the optimal frequency for your building, if there is such a thing. Um, this is a result of studying electronics. <laughs> um, so you can create quite complex type of geometries. They hold the relationship to each other and, um, you know, quite, um, there are a few of them here. So you can see I created the wave here, this wave going going inside and I'm rotating it and it holds the relationship to each other. So I'm hopefully gonna 3D print this. Okay, uh, going back to the, uh, talk about code block in Dynamo, quite powerful. This is another example of Dynamo, like it's just like you say on top of the column, we wanna define the parametrically you can um, define all these parameters and you, you're gonna think about this in advance. That's like how this information gonna influence your graph rather than it's like, that's why those graphs that are like the helper diagram are quite essential. So, you know, you can create this in Revit and then render it and, you know, when the geometry gets quite complex like this or um, even though like, you know, like geometry is like this, these two on the right are grasshopper and congru. This one on the left is Dynamo, but essentially when things get this complicated, it would be a continuous flow of information. So you can't really model this once. Architects cannot model this once and then send it back to a structural engineer and they want to remodel it, the exist, existing workflow in our industry. But like when the geometry get complex, there is no way that they can model this manually because it's a algorithm, it's, a, it's an algorithmic geometry. So for us to be able to build geometry like this, it needs to be a continuous flow of data and we need to do digital fabrication, which is quite possible. But like, and I believe overall, like it will save us time and energy and resources because you know how much time structure engineers spend to generate their models? Why not everyone work on one common data environment? I don't know, these are my different dreams. <laughs> well, uh, as long as algorithmic geometry goes, like, you know, you can um, come up with, I want to show this one. 
quite um, complex type of geometry. So his slides are a little bit, you know, this is a tree structure that holds the roof or something quite complex like that, or like, I don't know. So I'm just showing a couple of um, examples here of what is uh, what we can achieve. So you can see it's quite complex. Okay, going back to our example, um, what we're gonna do today, like quickly, we're gonna, I'm almost 40 minutes into the presentation. Like I have 20 minutes to finish this and it's a quite complex example. So I might not be able to like finish it all, but you guys have all the complete files and everything. I'll explain it how it works. By the way, this shelf is the one that is sitting on my back on the wall. So I built it. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Is everything okay? Yes, we can hear you, Alex. Oh, sure. I think everybody is flabbergasted. <laughs> Some Thank you. Very interesting structures. <laughs> and um, yeah, very, very nice presentation. So I think we come to the to the hands-on side of things, is it? Am I sure, correct? correct. Yeah. So does anybody want to have their laptops open or are we going to get Alex to show and tell on how all this works? Let it, let him go away. I think I think that's uh, that sounds like the best thing to do. Okay. So you're on. So you, you. Sure. I um what I what I have provided you guys with like it's an um I'll go through the examples in a second. But like what have oh, what have we? Apparently apparently there's some questions in the chat. Alex, you wanna you wanna open up the chat? I think you've got oh. control over that. Right. Okay. Yeah. And a Q and A. Okay, how to use AI in computational design in terms of actual results and benefit. As I have seen, most of the use cases are either only test. Well, see, as I said, like I don't think these are one man's job. There need to be a, a conversation around it. And then like once we have a clear um, understanding of the objective of the system, then we can design um, and talk AI. Um, one very interesting use case I can think of is like recognizing objects in the point cloud. That's something that like, I'm sure it will be out there. So clustering of the point cloud to recognize objects. Um, geometry optimization, AI in its own kind of term, like it's like kind of very misleading, essentially like it's a, such a buzzword, but like it's not that complex, the concept behind it, I think. So there are use cases, I mean like, for instance, why not using optimized um, structural members for the building to reduce the, you know, shapes? And I don't know. These are evolving, so there is a lot that can be done there. I don't have any more answer for that at the moment. So that was the question. Any other question you guys have? In fact, any anything more in the chat, uh, Alex? Can you have a look? Oh, this is essentially. There's another question popped in up there. Okay, yeah, it's 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 saying okay, perfect optimization might can be done um, with generative design. Yeah, it can. Like you know, you generate so many options that, and then you evaluate them. So, it's quite possible like to measure um, the high performance object. But you sometimes it's important to notice that you have actually competing factors. So it's not like uh, you can optimize the geometry for everything, but like, you know, you have competing factors that, what I like to say here, like AI, I don't think it's ever gonna replace designers at all. Like it would uh, kind of be a tool at their hands to, uh, to help them to realize how their design is performing or what, but like it can really never replace human. Any questions from the floor here? So if you, you want to continue, Alex? I'll yes, I, what I'll do, I'll, I'll continue yep. with this. So yeah, for this, let's run through this uh, parametric shelf. Sure. And um, sure. How, how much time do you still think you might need? 
Um, for this, if I want to go through the example, I'll, I'll try to wrap this up as quickly as possible and I'll, you guys have the files. I'll just explain how to set up the Excellent. study for it to work and what am I essentially doing. Like as you can see here, I have a, a parametric uh, shelf design and I have a sinus and cosinus wave defined as well. These are all points data going through the examples. What I have here is an ellipse, half an ellipse at the top because essentially I wanted to create, just give me one second. Take me, take this off so you guys can see uh, on my camera. So here I wanted to have an ellipse. Here down the bottom, I wanted to have a sinus wave. Not a simple sinus wave, like it's just like a, a function of sinus and cosinus. And here at the middle of this, because I wanted to have this geometry to have some sort of a bulk here. So I'm defining another curve here in the middle. So you can see here, like this is, uh, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, um, like on the screen, but you can see on the picture on the top left, there's the ellipse at the top, there is another sinus wave in the middle and there is one sinus wave right at the bottom. So we model this once and these are in Revit, um, rendered in Revit, yeah, you know, like you come up with the concept once and then you can essentially generate so many different um, objects. You know, it's the same thing, but by the way, the one that I decided to build is this one, down the bottom left hand side. And this is in Revit, like I'm used adaptive component for this. And um, essentially, uh, if, if you guys can answer me, can you see my um, mouse on the screen? Or not really? Yep, we can see it. Okay, awesome. So essentially what I'm doing, like this, this is, these are all the panels cut and assembled next to each other to create that geometry. What I'm uh, calculating is, uh, points on the corner, like there is one point here, one point at the top, one point here. This point at here, which is defined by my ellipse, a point in the middle here, one point down the bottom, right? And this is the uh, result of it. So before going to open the actual um, dynamograph, like I just wanted to say like this, uh, these are operating on data and collaboration is quite important. So with that in mind, I'm just going to bring my uh, open, bear with me for a second, please. So if you go to, uh, to the file that I have uh, provided for you guys, uh, there is this folder here. If you go to handout, there is a good PDF that explain everything, um, how this workflow works. Yeah. That aside, um, if you go to the lab file, there's also complete files here for you. So there is a Revit family and final dynamograph you can run. Load that family um, into your Revit environment. Uh, and these are like you say, um, exercise one, exercise two, exercise three, it's like gradually kind of um, set. Um, what I want you to do first thing to first, like get this um, eight point adaptive component and drag it to the Revit environment. Just bear with me one second, please. So if I, um, I have so many applications open, <laughs> it's hard to navigate. So I'm just grabbing the um, Revit family into my... So you can see it asked me for eight points to create that um,
Yeah. So this is essentially uh, um, all created by Adaptive Phone. Like if I go to my family here. So you can see um, this is this is how it's done. Like point one being the center of my um, shelf. Point two is the one right down the bottom that is defined by the sinus wave. Point three is the one that is defined with the sinus wave with 45 degree angle. Here, this 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 curve. So this is the, um, all these points here, as you can see, I assign them to point two down the bottom. All these points here in the middle, I don't know if you can see them here. These are um, point trees are assigned to it. And this is, um, you know, point four, five, six to create that kind of um, balustrade look at the front. The way that I've done this is um, I've created my point three here. And then I connect them together, uh, leave a, a reference point at the middle of that, and then do the same thing on the, between point three and four, this point in the middle, and then I connect those two and put them point in the middle. This is a concept of Bazier curve, essentially. Like you, you smooth the curve out. Um, and yeah, so this, this is my Revit family here. Yeah. So now that I have this, if I go back to my Dynamo instance for this Revit file, this is this is example 001, so it's not complete. Like it's essentially a set of uh, a set of um, nodes that calculate does my calculation, a, a custom made node that does my um, sinus and cosinus calculation. Frequency is here. Like I'm not going to go through this, but this is essentially the formula that you use for um, sinus and cosinus wave. And then if, if you multiply them together or subtract them together, I have two curves defined because I, want, I didn't want that straight look of sinus wave. So what I ended up doing, I ended up creating a um, wave for um, sinus of alpha plus two cosinus of alpha. So that like, I'll get that care we look like these are all, you know, we can have a chat about this if you found it interesting later on. So we can talk, but this is a custom node within Dynamo environment. So as you can see, all the input to that node, it, it's just like to make my code cleaner and like, you know, right click and freeze it if you want it to work. So this is example of O1. I'm quickly going to open O2 and 3 again. 51 minutes into my presentation, I have nine minutes. <laughs> Finish it on time. So example number two here, if I run it, you see I have, um, uh, you see I have like a freeze this node. So if I unfreeze it, right click on unfreeze it, I should get my three points. So see, this is the first curve that I was talking about, right down the bottom. This 45 degree curve is another one, 45 degree angle, another one, and the ellipse at the tops is another one. So like I'll essentially create this parametrically. And then what I'm doing, I'll um, connect the first point of my eclipse, uh, eclipse to the ellipse, sorry, eclipses, <laughs> to the other end and then like divide it to the equal distance um, with this. So like I can change this to like you say, if I say change distance between the slice to two, you see number of points increases. Or if I change it to 10, I should overall have 50, about 15 points. Like you get the, you get what I'm doing here. Like I'm creating, um, a list of value, as you can see, from minus 80 to plus 80. And where is this coming from? Because my total length is 160 divided by two. So I'm essentially creating all the points by that distance. That's the formula to do it. 
lengths divided by two, lower uh, minus lengths divided by two, lower side of your, um, uh, what do you call it, domain, higher side of your claim, and then like what is the amount that you, they are increasing, right? So this is quite simple. Uh, from there, what I'm doing, I'm going to, by the way, if you press control I, it hide everything in your graph and then like it only show the one that you select. This feature is quite handy. Uh, so I'm creating my point, as you can see. Here. Come on. You can see that point. I'm creating it and creating the slicing panel, like, you know, the slicing um, plane. And then I create this plane parametrically and then I use um, coordination uh, YZ plan. So I'll get all the YZ plan of these points. As you can see here, these planes, she's showing in the background. And then what I do, I'll collide them with my geometry. So like here I have my ellipse set up and then I'm intersecting my uh, ellipse with those plane that I have created there. For the other part, like as you can see, a bottom curve, I'm using my custom node that you guys have access to. By the way, if the custom node, if you want, when you open the model doesn't work, then just drag and drop this um, file, uh, the file uh, into your uh, Dynamo environment and it should work. So the custom node definition is this one. Yeah, DYF standing for custom node. Um, essentially what I'm doing here, I'm creating the curve for those two and then I'm colliding them with the points. Right, this is uh, dimension two. Sorry, I'll, I will wrap up very quickly. If I open the uh, example three, so like I essentially what I did by example one, two, three, like I break up the process into um, smaller segments so it's easier for you guys to follow, hopefully. So this is, um, just remember to unfreeze um, your node and then hit run. So now you can see in the next stage, what I'm doing, I'm essentially uh, creating uh, my geometry through those points. So this is interesting because like I have to define a various set of um, parameters, like this part, like we know already what I was doing there. I'm essentially getting this other curve here and then rotating it 45 degree. Like, so if I change the preview of this geometry on, you can see what I'm doing. So I'm running these points and then I'm assigning my adaptive component to those points. Control B put you back into the um, definition mode. So this is one curve, sorry, if I change the preview of this one. This is the points on the curve. And then from there, I'm creating my front curve. Like how do I do it? I connect all the points from my ellipse, the first curve, the second curve, as you can see, you're selected, they're highlighted. I transpose the list and then I create the um, nerve curve through those points. Right, so I can go and um, the same story here at the top, but I'm creating the curves right at the back from these points and the um, original point that I had. So just to explain this one, like you see, like I'm creating a list item one and item two for the item one. If I go back all the way to here, you will see item one are these points. right? And my item two is this set of points, right down the bottom. And then I'll, all I'm doing, I'm creating a list here as I showed and um, it's hard, a little bit hard to navigate, but, and then transposing the list and draw my curve through that. Essentially the, for the front curve, the same thing 
and the top one as well. Right? It's just now what I have to do is like defining that um, thickness. So because if you look at the, uh, if you look at the cutting, I have this bit sitting at the front. So I have to manually define that as a parameter, you know, like up here, up down there. So calculating the point, you can see I can change the, um, the hop height if I want to. You know, it still holds. Yeah. The because it's like you know I'm not manually modeling this. I'm, I'm building up the relationship between them. And um, yeah, so that's that's it. And then like um, right at the end, I open the last file. The final file, you can find it and open it in your monograph. But see, uh, for these tools to be able to be used, like the user of the tools need to know what they're doing. So it's not like, it's like I hear this so many times that people are like, oh, this doesn't work, Dynamo doesn't work. It's just like, how is it that it works for um, me when I, or a person who has created it works for them because it's like if you want to use the workflow like you could actually study it before and get your head around the logic I mean like these are project specific like I'm not talking about um, I'm not talking about like I don't know uh, uh, optimizing like I don't know it's just like mm, drawing creation automation or those are falling under the system design sort of category if you like and then um, right at the end this is the final Uh, graph and I'm creating at the top, I'm creating my dynamo geometry, as you can see. Right, all this like, you know, panels are defined. And then right at the end here, if you look at it, I'm creating the list in the order that I want and I um, have frozen this bit because um, because it's like, you know, making this geometry in Revit is a little bit slow. So before me creating this, I just want to quickly change some parameters here so you can see. So if I change this to like, I don't know, 30, it's a frequency, you should see a more complex geometry. So. Right? And nothing like I can I can change the height of it as well. Like it's fully parametric in every single. I'm changing the height of my geometry, so I'm expecting the geometry to get bigger. And then, like you say, if I'm happy with this, yeah, maybe I'm happy. Maybe it's just like I don't know. It's, it's relatively heavy, but let's let's build this in Revit to wrap things up. So here. Scaling the geometry, I unfreeze it, transpose the list, adoptive component by point. I'm assigning, select the family that you want, eight point adoptive component, and let's bring our, no, yeah. Bring our Revit. Now you can see I can see my geom dynamo geometry, but it's not a Revit geometry yet. But if I go, and hit run now, it should go through all of those instances and assign. It might take a little bit of time. We'll assign all the adoptive points to the points. Takes a little bit of time. So um, yeah, like once this is done, then I think I mean, good luck modeling that in Revit. <laughs> it just doesn't work. <laughs> so like you can see. That's so how we make way. Department of Conservation platforms in New Zealand. <laughs> That's pretty impressive, Alex. Thank you so much. So I think this is it for me. So like you can see all of these are, you know, instance of a, um, so Revit says Revit doesn't deal with complex geometry. 
we've just been proven completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it's a very valid question to see, like, if you want to actually design this in Grasshopper or um, Rhino, but I, I assume these are, like, when we talk in this level of complexity and data, it, tools doesn't really matter. Like, it's just, like, you know, the workflow is, is the most important. Have you, have you done a comparison between the shelf using Grasshopper? No, I haven't. Not really. No. I mean, like in terms of geometry, like it will work a lot faster, I assume, uh, um, in Grasshopper. Because the way that data structure is set up in Grasshopper, like they use tree data structure rather than a list that is used for Dynamo. So I think like that's one of the reasons that makes the threat um, faster in that sense. I mean, like, it's a very valid question. Like, I don't know, like, you know, like if, if you want to document things, Revit is, is the way to go. Like you can't really document things in Grasshopper, right? But you might be able to create this and push them back in Rhino, inside, using Rhino inside. Very so, yeah. Good. I think we've got a question here from the audience. I'll just sure. send you over to Amadeo. Hi, Alex. Thank you very much for your presentation. You're very welcome. <laughs> Uh, I just a note, I started following Alex about two years ago, uh, LinkedIn, and I always appreciated your experimental approach to explore connections between mathematical functions and geometries. So it always fascinated me. Thank you it so much. Fascinated me. Um, <laughs> I personally am a fan of low level textual programming, but mm -hmm. I always liked the potential of interactive 3D viewing of geometries using Dynamo. So I think that you showed why is so important, okay, not just to rely on, uh, on uh, um, uh, textual programming approaches, but also relying on Dynamo for this kind of uh, mm -hmm. generative, not just generative design, but parametric design. Um, and I think that what you showed is basically debugging geometries. Um, if you think about um, textual programming approaches, you have uh, functions for debugging the code. So uh, when you go with classic programming, you have this potential of tracing back and understanding what's happening in your code when you change something. And you demonstrated the same with geometries using the, the, the interactive viewer of Dynamo. So uh, when you selected parameters, uh, uh, Dynamo highlighted uh, what, geometries what, ge what part of the geometry was affected by that part of the, of the code. Okay. So I guess this is one of the most powerful, uh, let's say, function of Dynamo. So thank you for that. No worries. No, no, no worries. You are you're absolutely right. Like, I mean, it's, as I said, like Dynamo is quite like you after, like I've been doing this for a long time, but like, it's, it's like, as you go into this, like you, you, you figure out ways of grouping functions together. Like essentially this is like, I don't know how um, familiar are we with the coding processes, but like you say, when you define a class in C sharp, that class has some entry as a fun, uh, like input parameter to that function and some output, like, you know, it does some sort of, method. but you can maintain those sort of graphical um, relationship, like using certain sort of color coding, all the parameters that I always use, I'll define, like, you know, I group them together, like all the parameters are on the, on the left hand side of my group. So like, if I know, like automatically, if I want to change that degree to 45, I know where should I look. You know, and then like um, all the parameters are defined in blue color at the beginning. So like, um, and these are, these are essentially like, you know, um, these are essentially um, functions you define in a visual way. So like, I think it's very fast to develop codes in um, Dynamo, yes, but it doesn't, uh, it might not hold um, or handle heavy, amounts of data, but you always have, you know, you always have access to this beautiful Python interface here, as we know. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, if there's no more questions from the audience, I think we can close off this meeting. Oh. Um, yeah. If, if you find any of this like in particular interesting or you want to know more about like these um, workflows that I, please don't hesitate to reach out. So that's, that's, all, that's all I wanted to. Yep, Good I luck. want Alex to be very approachable as Amadeo mentioned as well. So we certainly uh, 
likes to connect. So if you want to, I think there was an email address at the um, start of the presentation. So yeah. definitely get in touch with them. Sure. It's just like one last thing and I wrap up. It's just like, I just want to say that like, I think this, tools are really powerful but like we can't really get them off the ground without collaboration it's not like somebody can create this and everybody can use it like there needs to be discussion about how this geometry is developed and all the you know like um but i believe we can essentially change the way that construction works with this like kind of um data centric approach yeah i think it's bridging the gap between signs and design and i think we're uh, we're not quite there yet um, obviously, I think the younger generation, hear me saying that, um, mm -hmm. I've been saying that for the last 20 years, the younger generation, but then when I look at my son, he really doesn't like programming, he's young generation, so I'm not sure where <laughs> this is going to go. But, um, <laughs> some time ago, somebody said to me, and I think I can remember who that was, said, if you're not a coder, you're going to be out of business in a few years. Well, I think we're still here after 20 years, and that was 20 years ago when somebody told me that. So. I think you're right. By collaboration, it, it takes a special breed of people to dive into this type of technology. And by working and collaborating with designers that have um, the vision for creation, but maybe not quite the scientific tool set for assisting in that creation, I think if we can bridge that gap, um, we see a very different um, structure moving forward uh, with design organizations. Thank right. you. Yeah. I'll, clo sure. I'll close it off here, Alex. Alex, very much. Thank you very much for your time. You yeah. are very welcome. And the recording would be available, correct? It's just, just to confirm. Correct. Yes, it yes. will be. And um, I'd like to thank the audience for being online. Um, I think we could see that we had about 16 sure. participants at the highest level, which is fantastic. So I think there's about 14, 15 people here. So, you know, turn up of about 33 is great for a group. Um, I'd like to call out to anyone that is um, or want to participate with the Dynamo user group to um, come forward. And even if you've got something what you believe is very simple to present, you know, please call, you know, call out to the uh, committee members here and uh, make that known. You know, we, we're here to learn from each other. We're here to collaborate. Um, sometimes it does feel a bit like a show and tell, but um, you know, hopefully um, we can entice some of the audience member to um, you know, come forth and um, do some small presentations at their part as well. All right. Thank you very much. And You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. We'll, we'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, so, Alex. So. Thank you.